Good morning. morning. Would you please uh, respond with the call to worship? When we seek justice for the other, when we love kindness more than ever, when we walk humbly through life, when we offer mercy to those who hurt us, when we are willing to look foolish by following Jesus, when we choose weakness rather than power. Friends, let us worship God. Friends, as we light our peace lamp once again, would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Good and gracious God, we do give you thanks for this day and for this time together. And God, we come again this week as we do every week, asking for your wisdom, asking for your guidance, and helping us to seek peace, your peace, the peace that our world doesn't understand, a peace where justice and kindness and mercy and humility are the cornerstones of our faith. We lift up all, God, who are pursuing that peace all over the world. And we thank you, especially for our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and friends of the 10th Mountain Division, who are seeking peace. We lift up those who are deployed, especially those within our faith community and their families. We ask that you would would, uh, wrap your arms around them, keep them safe, and bring them home as quickly as possible. In the meantime, God, may your Holy Spirit descend upon all of us this day as we look for ways to seek peace within ourselves, our communities, our country, and our world. We give you thanks and praise in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. I invite us to stand as able. Our first hymn is number 451, Be Thou My Vision.
Christ, shield me today against wounding Christ with me. Christ behind me, Christ behind me, Christ with me, Christ beneath me, Christ on my feet, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ in my right arm, Christ in my second arm, Christ in the eye that the one faces me, Christ in the eye that sees sees me, Christ in the eye that sees me. Christ in the ears that hear me. Amen. You may be seated. I would invite kids to come on up for a few minutes. Over this way, Olivia. Let's keep our social distance, though, this morning. Six feet. (laughs) Olivia. Come on. Very good. Will we sit down for a few minutes? Thanks. See, we can do this. How many of you play basketball? Olivia, you play basketball. What do you need to play basketball? A ball. A ball. What kind of ball? A basketball. A basketball. Very good. What else do you need? A net. A net. What else? Okay. What else? You need two of them. Sneakers. Sneakers. All right. How many of you like to draw? Does anybody like to draw? Do you like to draw? William, do you like to draw? What do you need to draw with, do you think? Okay. You like to draw cowboys. Well, when you draw a cowboy, do you need crayons? Yeah. What else? Do you need paper? Yeah. Cowboy paper. Sharpies. Sharpies. Yeah. That's really good. Um, Does anybody know how to knit? Does anybody out there know how to knit? All right. Anybody? Sue, what do you need to knit? Needles. Needles. What else? Yarn. Yarn. Excellent. You know the materials. So what do we need to get close to God? A Bible. That's that's right. We need a Bible. What's a Bible? It is a book that tells us all about God. He's thinking. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? Now, the scripture we're going to study this morning comes from the Bible. It is Micah 6. And in your, in your bulletins this morning, you will see a little error. It's not Micah 1. It is Micah 6, 1 through 8. And what Micah tells us at the end, it says, What does the Lord require? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Any idea what it means to do justice? Is there any idea out there? What does it mean to do justice? Be fair. Very good. Olivia. To do justice is to be... Tell the truth is always good. How do, you, how do you show kindness to people? Any idea how to show kindness to people? Maybe do what mom or dad would like you to do without them asking. Wouldn't that be swell? Wouldn't that be swell, Nate? Yeah. Yeah. You know, do a good deed for somebody. You know, hold the door open for somebody. What? Help somebody with their groceries. That's always a good thing. And to walk humbly with our God. How do you think we can do that? What? We can pray. We can... We can figure out what God would like us to do. You know, those things don't seem too hard, do they? But sometimes we have to practice them. It's like practicing when you first start basketball. Were you really good at basketball when you first started? Yes. You were. All right, well, that didn't work out very well. (laughs) Sue, when you started knitting, were you really good at knitting? Thank you. 
I wasn't either. I tried to knit and I tried to knit a scarf. You know how a scarf is supposed to go straight like this? Well, my, my scarf went like this. I was terrible at it. But I got better because we practice. It didn't work out, but you have to practice. And we have to practice doing acts of justice to be fair. We have to practice being kind. We have to practice to be humble. Does that make sense to you guys? Does that make sense up there? Does that make sense out there? All right, then I think we're, we've all made sense. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, you have told us what is required. And it isn't hard, but we have to practice it. Help us, God, this week to do the right thing, to show people kindness, and help us to walk humbly with you. And we give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, guys, have a wonderful morning. Thanks for coming. Okay. Friends, we do come to a time in our service where we have witnesses to the presence of God in our lives, those God sightings, those joys and concerns. Um, I would ask that you would pray for a friend of mine. Her name is Reverend Eunice Tabor. She was my mentor. Um, the only reason I'm, I am here is because of her guidance and her, her assistance. And she is, she is ill. Um, she had emergency surgery last Sunday. Um, so I would ask that you would keep her and her, your, her family in your prayers. Other joys, concerns, God sightings. Lindsay. I'm going to try this microphone. Or you could just come down here, Lindsay. It's for me. Okay. That would even be better. Thank you. Okay. Just a, a quickie that, I don't know if you're aware of it, but at the mall, the, the, the movies, Jeremy Camp is a Christian singer. He's an incredible singer. And his story, his life story, is at the movies. It's called I Still Believe. Uh, we had no idea. Pete and Kathy and Dan and I went yesterday, and you'd need a box of tissues. But phenomenal movie. Please go see it if you can. They're only allowing, they're being careful of how many people go into the movies, too. Uh, sold out is only half full, so that people can sit in enough space around. But you, it's well worth your time. Just unbelievable. Thanks, Lindsay. Others? Bruce. I would ask for prayers for Lorraine as she leaves from Taiwan tomorrow to come home. Uh, we're not sure uh, some of the schedules that she's going to have, but we hope, we're hoping that she gets home safe and uh, healthy and on time. Thank you. Thank you. Other joys, concerns, God sightings, Paul. Yes, uh, our grandson has been in Afghanistan for the last 10 months. He's home. Oh, yay. He's at Fort Bragg. Uh, unfortunately, his whole unit does have to be quarantined for 14 days, just like everyone else that comes back. But he's here, and that's important. Thank you. Thanks. I would ask that you would also keep all those in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and the hospital in your prayers. Um, as you know, they're on lockdown, and some of those folks really look forward to visits, and they can't have visits from their family or their friends. Uh, Darlene and I were lucky. We went to Sam Keep on Tuesday, um, and, and we went to uh, Summit the week before, but we don't know when we're going to be able to get back there. But you can call, and you can certainly pray for them. Um, and also pray for all the doctors and the nurses, all the folks at Samaritan and all the hospitals. This is a day-by-day -day thing, and they are getting overwhelmed with information and what to do and what not to do and patient load and all of that stuff. So let's keep our health professionals in our prayers as well. Lenora. Uh, yes, I have two things. Uh, one, uh, my grandmother is now officially with hospice. Oh. So please continue keeping her in your prayers. And also, Kenny has had a fluke accident. The knee that he was recovered from, what, shortly three weeks ago? He now has pulled a tendon and it's locked underneath a ligament. 
or cartilage, cartilage. So he needs surgery on Tuesday. So please keep him in your prayers. Same knee he injured? Same knee. Okay. So prayers for Kenny and prayers for Lenora's grandmother as she is on hospice. Others? Anyone? Hearing none, let us pray. We lift our prayers to you this morning, God. All of the joys that we have this beautiful day that you have gifted us with, this opportunity to be together as brothers and sisters, to worship you, to give thanks to you, to give thanks for this day, to give thanks for life, to give thanks for the sun, to give thanks for each other, to give you thanks for your word and your word made flesh in Jesus. We lift up birthdays and anniversaries, times that we spend with family. And we lift up prayer concerns to you, God. And especially in these uncertain times, may we look to you, the rock of our salvation. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other is shifting sand. May we continue to stand on you, our rock, our salvation the one that gives us strength and encouragement. Gracious God, we live in uncertain times, in the best of times, and right now we are really living in very uncertain times. May your spirit guide us. May your spirit bring us a sense of peace, a real sense of peace and a real sense of your presence, God. Help us to be prudent and cautious and faith-filled at the same time. In our scripture passage today, God, help us to unpack what Micah talks about, to do justice, to love kindness, and to humbly walk with you. May those be our marching orders today and always. We are thankful that you have heard all of our prayers, the joys, the struggles, the concerns, the God sightings, both shared and held. We are confident that you not only hear, but will respond. So God, we are thankful for today. We are thankful for your Holy Spirit, and we are very thankful for your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus. In Jesus' words we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world.
Lesson for this week is from Micah 6, 1 through 8, and I will be reading from the NIV. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Bozik, king of Mobad, counseled, and what Balsam and son of Bear answered. Remember your journey from Shechem to Galilee, that you may know the righteous act of the Lord. With what I shall come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Our next uh, hymn is from the faith we... Um, <laughs> Huh? Yeah, 2166, Christ Beside Me. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, thank you once again for this day, this time together, for your Holy Spirit that was here before us, preparing us and this place. Take away all that would stop us from hearing your word and refill us with your spirit. O oh Lord our God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Well, during the Lenten season, we committed to the study of five of the spiritual disciplines. We started with worship. And as you might recall, Catholic writer Evelyn Underhill defined worship as the response of the creature to the creator. As the source of our entire existence, our worship of God tells God how much God means to us, how much God means to us, how much we love God, and how much we want to serve God. We discovered that ideally it is within the context of a faith community where we worship God on a regular basis. We found that we need each other's encouragement and we need each other's accountability. We hear God speak to us through song, through testimony, through prayers, through scripture, and through the sermon. The experience then recharges our spiritual batteries so that we can face whatever happens during the ensuing week. Last week, we studied the spiritual discipline of study. Study helps us to listen for and recognize God's voice as we learn to pay attention to the way God discloses God's self to us. We learn God uses multiple ways to reveal God's self to us. We learn nature, the arts, intuition, our own life experiences, and the experiences of others are ways God reveals God's self to us in what the theologians like to call general or natural revelation. While general revelation is one tool where we can uh, see God reveal God's self to us, the Lenten Studies author, Adam Hamilton, we are studying the book, The Walk. In that book, he says, just observing the world around us does not guarantee that we'll draw the right conclusion about God's character. That's why special revelation, God's direct disclosure of the divine self and will is important. We then can interpret and understand general revelation in light of this special revelation. We studied three incidences of special revelation. The first was the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's whisper or nudge is similar to intuition. It's that gentle poke after the choir sings. Or a revelation possibly during the sermon, prayer time, or as we live joys and concerns. Perhaps a thought brought to the front of your mind that you never understood before as you read a passage of scripture can be a way the Holy Spirit reveals God's self to us. The overarching question, of course, becomes how can we discern if it's the Holy Spirit speaking or just our own thoughts? And we learned that sounding it out with trusted Christian friends is one approach. Another approach that we like to call the um, Wesleyan quadrilateral, if you want to try to impress people, it is using a four-part assessment which incorporates scripture, the traditions of the church, your own experiences and the experiences of others, in addition to reason, can also help determine whether this is from the Holy Spirit or our own thinking. Scripture, we found out, is also God's special revelation, as it is God's people recording their experiences and their reflection on how God spoke to them and interacted in their lives. For us to apply these truths to our lives in the 21st century requires the intentional study of scripture. As we become more familiar with scripture, we can then draw upon it to help us shape our actions. 
We also learned God revealed God's self to us in the person of Jesus, the Word who was with God and the Word who was God. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, according to the Gospel of John. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. God chose to come to earth. God incarnate, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us in Jesus Christ. This week, the spiritual discipline we'll discuss is service. Now, Adam Hamilton asked the question, what did Jesus do most of the time? So I'll open that up to you all. This is the dreaded audience participation. <laughs> what did Jesus do most of the time? Pardon? Serve others. Well, yeah, but you were, you've been in the Bible study, so that's... A, <laughs> what else did Jesus do? He taught. What else? He prayed. He healed. He listened. Guess what Jesus did quite a bit of the time? He ate. Jesus liked to eat. There are so many... He did... Like many of us, he liked to eat. He ate with both the religious authorities and, more importantly, he ate with those with whom the Pharisees had the largest complaint with Jesus. He ate with sinners. And he served the sinners by eating with them. One of my favorites, he ate with sinners just such as Zacchaeus, that wee little guy who had to get a good view of Jesus, had to climb a tree. Boy, can I relate to that one, <laughs> I'll tell you. Jesus invited himself. He said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to have dinner with you tonight. Talk about being bold. Jesus invited himself to have dinner with Zacchaeus, who everyone thought was the worst sinner on the face of the planet. And by inviting himself to dinner and interacting with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus' life transformed. Jesus spent time not just eating, but serving people. So many people, desperate, for healing, continually interrupted Jesus throughout his ministry. These people needed relief and release from physical illness, from brokenness, from loneliness, and spiritual and mental maladies. So it's not a big stretch for us that if we say we identify ourselves as Christians, if we say we are the body of Christ and followers of Jesus, then our calling is to do that which Jesus did. And since Jesus served others, our calling is to serve others as well. We feed others because that's what Jesus did. We listen to others because that's what Jesus did. Although we know there are times when miraculous things happen to people without human intervention, God's usual approach is to use we humans as those agents of healing and reconciliation. You see, in a very tangible way, we serve God as we serve others. And it truly is an opportunity to be that tangible sign of God to show others that God has not forgotten 
them. Now, sometimes service may involve our leaving our communities, our state, and even our country to minister to others. Dr. Ben went to Ethiopia on a medical mission trip two years ago. Some of our Asbury family went to Nepal, Nepal to experience life with um, the Zimmermans. Some folks have been to Red Bird Mission in Kentucky to minister to the Appalachian poor. I've been to rural West Virginia to minister to a single mom with two small children whose home was in desperate need of help. These are just a few of the many ways Christ followers serve the least and the dispossessed in our world. But many times, we don't have to leave our communities to serve others. The key is to pay attention to the Holy Spirit's nudgings to be the voice of hope for another. Pat Town, back there, right there, and I've gotten his permission, he shared a story with the Lenten Bible study last week concerning an encounter he had with a gas station attendant. Now, we know most convenience store jobs pay minimum wage at best. Many people run in and out of those stores without even a thank you to the person who helps them with their transaction, whether it's to pay for your gas, to get a coffee, or to get some other fast food. And some people can be downright rude if they feel that they've been inconvenienced. Perhaps they've had to wait maybe an extra 30 seconds in line, and people really get bent out of shape about that. The attendant on this particular day told Pat that Pat was the only person who ever thanked him for his service. And that was such a bright spot in that attendance day. How much did that cost, Pat? Nothing, right. It was free, it's freebie. How much did that mean to that gas station attendant? It was priceless. It was truly priceless. And that's what I'm saying is that we need to listen for those nudgings of the Holy Spirit when they're poking us to do something, to do the right thing. You know, sometimes we Christians try to make our walk with God so complicated. Many times I think we overthink our decisions. In Micah 6, 8, really does give us our marching orders. It says, the Lord has told you, has told you what is good, and this is what God requires of you, to do what is right, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. What God asks of us, friends, is not complicated at all. However, these three edicts may take us a lifetime to fulfill. And like I said to the kids this morning, it takes practice. It takes practice. It's like when you start learning basketball or hockey or any sport, figure skating. First time I went out on the ice, I stepped one foot out and down I went. Oh, it was not a pretty picture at all. There was no grace in that whatsoever. But in time, I could get out on the ice. I didn't have to hold on to the edge of the rink and I could actually skate because it took practice. And these three things, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God, they're not hard, but they do take practice. And a lot of times these things are counterintuitive to what our society really wants us to do. But these three actions truly are the cornerstone of a right relationship with God. And on this Sunday that is so close to St. Patrick's Day, I wanted to tell you the story because I think this really fits in with our story of Micah 
Back in the late 4th or early 5th century, a 16-year-old boy named Patrick lived a privileged life as the son of an aristocratic, marginally Christian, Roman Britain family. Now sometime during his 16th year, a band of Celtic pirates from Ireland raided Britain. Taken against his will and shipped to Ireland, Patrick became a slave to a druid and was put to work herding cattle in the hills. The work was hard, it was dangerous, the conditions were absolutely brutal. There wasn't much to eat. It was cold, it was absolutely miserable. And in those bleakest of times, Patrick chose to turn to the God that he had ignored in his privileged life in Britain. Patrick began to pray many times each day. In time, he began to identify with the very people who had enslaved him. He learned their language. He learned their culture. He understood their own view of the world and their religion. And in time, he even came to love them as people who one day might turn to the triune God. Now, six years later, he escaped his captors. He walked 200 miles to the sea, and he negotiated passage on a ship bound for Britain, where he was reunited with his family. Now, if it were me, that would be the very last time I would ever even think about Ireland. There would be no way in God's green earth that I would ever want to step foot on that shore again. However, the Holy Spirit had different designs on Patrick, and the Holy Spirit continued to nudge him. And in time, Patrick recognized his need to go back to Ireland and serve those who had enslaved him as a teen. He studied for the priesthood, he became a priest, and once he became a priest, he received permission to go back and to minister to the Irish. And in Ireland, Patrick's rebel streak kind of shone through because instead of doing things the Roman way, as in read and speak Latin and adopt Roman customs and do church as in Rome, Patrick chose to minister relationally. He learned about each tribe when he entered a community. He learned their language. He learned their customs. He engaged them in conversation. He prayed for the sick. He counseled those in need. And he mediated conflict. He made a difference among the people. And they responded by trusting in Patrick's God. In his service to the Irish, I believe Patrick's life mirrored Micah 6.8. He did what was right. He loved them. He showed kindness to them. And he walked humbly with his God. Now, thankfully, We have that same opportunity as Patrick without being captured by Celtic pirates. We don't need that part of it. Now, how would it look, because we know St. Patrick's Day is in two days, how would it look if we celebrated St. Patrick's Day this year by choosing to do five random acts of kindness to others in a week? Just five random acts of kindness. How do you think that might impact 
the communities in which we live. What if then you challenged a friend of yours to do five random acts of kindness to others this week? Then what would happen if they challenged one of their friends, etc., etc., etc.? Perhaps in these random acts of kindness, someone may discover God has not abandoned them, that God loves them and desires a relationship with them. After all, isn't that what Jesus would do? Let us pray. Holy One of God, it's not complicated. As much as we like to make life complicated, your word tells us very succinctly what you want from us. Help us this week to do the right thing, to act justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Amen. Well, we do come to a time in our service, friends, where we do present ourselves, and then we present tithes and gifts for our morning offering. Join me in the prayer of dedication as printed in your bulletins. Let us pray. May we always be foolish enough to offer our gifts to you, generous God, for you use them to bring justice to the oppressed, to bring laughter to those who mourn, and to offer wonder to little children. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is from the hymnal number 593.
just an FYI, there is no coffee hour after worship today. And a reminder that if you are in the Monday night Bible study, please come down front just for a few minutes after worship today so we can talk about what we want to do for the next couple weeks. So I invite us to join together in the sending forth as printed in our bulletins. We have been nourished by God's grace and hope. We are called to follow the one who is weak and powerless. We learn what is right and good from the Holy Spirit. And so we will go as fools to be blessings to the wise, as well as to do not what is easy, but what is difficult. Amen.